So, Jeff, I mean, you, you told me some uh, really fascinating um, numbers uh, ahead of the, the morning uh, about the number of companies that you're seeing around the world from the angel stage right through to the growth stage. I mean, you are right on the front lines of this, and I wonder if you could share a bit of that, what you can, with, with us uh, publicly. And, and then this question of, you know, pick one or two really exciting things that are, that, that are making you excited at the moment. Yeah, I think, um, as I was saying before, we play with, uh, if you look at the market now and if you just go back five years, all of the disruption you're seeing is coming from that five years ago that was innovating. Uh, and today you see twice as many startups in, in the transportation and energy space as you did five years ago, and you see three times the funding. So that means as we go forward, we're going to see an you know, accelerated form of, of disruption that we're seeing today. And so for us, we're, we focus on five areas. One of the main areas is transportation within Nelson Energy. Uh, and we have uh, one of our startups coming out uh, later this year is an e-scooter startup, really to go combat kind of the congestion in cities and how people want to get from point A to point B. You can put them in cars or you can put them in there, but you still have to solve getting from point A to point B. Uh, and so the idea of the e-scooter startup is to allow that to happen in, in major cities, and we're going to be... Uh, unveiling it a little bit later this year. But it's also going to help cities get a lot smarter uh, because you now can start to crowdsource where people are moving and how they're moving. Uh, and so that data can be used to replan cities and do different things. So it's, it's not just the, the scooter itself, but it's the, the Trojan horse, if you will, of the data behind it that will become really important to us. And if you play data out just a little bit um, as far as facts go, if you go three years out from today, which is about 2019, 90% of all data on the planet will be created in the last two years. Uh, that means if I digitize the 40,000 years of human existence, it's only going to make up 10%. So it's the idea of us getting a lot smarter with a lot more data. Uh, so we're playing in that. And then if you look, uh, secondly, we, we play a lot in, in the technology of batteries as well. Uh, and lithium, and there's lots of things, there's lots of limitations of lithium, but how, it, how, how you process uh, and interact with batteries is important, and I think this is why, how many of you have iWatches? Yeah, well, this is why I don't think iWatch is going to work. Um, but uh, the reason you don't have iWatches is uh, because after about eight hours, they turn into a, a dead dark band on your wrist, uh, and that has to do with the battery. Uh, we have some tech coming out in the wearable space where uh, the battery will last one year. Uh, so that's coming out uh, later this year. I thought you had up. <laughs> yeah, we're actually using it in the, in the pet space. So uh, I think Fitbit for pets, but the battery will last a year. Uh, so, and we can take that across into other spaces. So those are just a couple of things, but uh, hopefully that's uh, shedding some light. As well as the innovation in tech, what about the innovation in finance? I mean, I was reading just the other day that uh, one of the big retailers has now got a scheme where it's actually raising money from its own customers, crowdsourcing money for its customers to pay for its own um, roof array, the electricity of which it will use, and the benefits go to the customer, I think, at 5% at rate of return. I mean, with that kind of thing happening, and there are many other examples, as you know, what, what, what do you think there? Well, in, I mean, again, we're, we're a corporate venture capital firm, so we're unique because we're tapping all of that corporate capital part on balance sheets, which is about $2 trillion. And if we can activate that, we can create a lot of opportunities and a lot of jobs and a lot of innovation. And in, in fintech, which is our, our, one of our largest areas, um, I think the most disruption we're seeing is in, is in the blockchain. Uh, and the blockchain can create you know, massive disruption across fintech when you start to say, I don't need a, a ledger anymore. Uh, when you remove ledgers, you can start doing a lot of things. You can imagine in the autonomous space, you, you get in a taxi cab, that taxi cab will pay for itself, it will bill you, there will be no human involved in it, uh, all because of the blockchain. So that's our, one of our biggest areas of investment and in, in what we're focusing on. Yes, very exciting times. Manuela, um, for DHL, cities obviously hugely important, and yeah, and there are so many cities are really, you know, keen to be on the front rank of all this. They, you hear mayors um, talking about how if governments, national governments stumble, they're going to be there, all the cities talking to each other to, uh, to make it happen as the second line of defense. But we don't think of cities, don't tend to think of cities as terribly innovative places necessarily at the moment. What, what's your take on, on innovation and cities and, and their role in all this going forward? I think definitely 
innovation is everywhere. So I think if we want to to see the positive side, we see it, and people who want to see the negative side, they will always see the negative. So there are many innovations done by cities who want to have a better life for citizens. City logistics is for sure very important for DHL, and we cannot have like one standard solution. It really depends on the typology of the city, on yeah, on the total setup. So we need to be extremely pragmatic, be global in the thinking, but act in, in a local um, in a local manner. About the technology, as we speak a lot about that, Internet of Things and the connectivity is really important. For DHL, when you have hundreds of aircraft, more than 90,000 commercial vehicles, have the right data at the right time is really strategic. But as we speak about technology, what I find really the most exciting is the capability of people to humanize the technology. And probably a lot of investments are done in the sexy stuff about technology, but maybe less in communicating to people to make sure they will absorb and the technology will really fit their needs. So instead of having people to adapt to the technology, making sure that the technology adapt to people. And just one example, as we speak about data, I would like to make a small test and need your assistance. If I ask to you, if you have the possibility to give to your boss the capability to track what you do any time in the day, would you like that? I don't see any hands, <laughs> normally it's the case. So if I ask the question in another way, in case you have an accident, would you like to have the possibility to be rescued within the three coming minutes? If you like, please raise your hand. In fact, it's the same question. It's about the data management, but it's about communicating to people and really understand that the technology is there for people and not the contrary. Yeah, it's, these questions are so important. Alejandro had the example earlier of Volkswagen, and I think what was really striking about that amazing decision to try and seek redemption in a complete uh, reinvention with electric vehicles, robo-taxes, you know, shared ride networks, all this, that came out of consultation with the workforce. That wasn't the management, and they were very frank, they were very frank about that. So that's, fa that's a fascinating point. So. Uh,